All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so for, I mean, uh, when Jan and I entered the room, we realized we only recognize a few faces and that is, means um, that I haven't been in Buffalo for a very long time. I actually used, when uh, Werner came, went down memory lane, he, he took me with him because among, you know, I was also around in these early days in 2004. I was the victim of Barry hiring Werner because he then decided to move to Saarbrücken and from Leipzig. And Leipzig is a very, very nice place and I really would have liked to live there. I lived in Berlin, was about to move to Leipzig, and then I had to move to Saarbrücken. And I'm not, you know, I, I, should, uh, I shouldn't speak to you for that very reason. <laughs> because it was, Saarbrücken is not so nice. Anyway, so, um, we, uh, uh, yeah, we didn't, actually I didn't talk to Werner for a long time, not because I'm angry to him, but uh, you won't notice that because it seems like we almost, we had communicated because a lot of things you, are, you were talking about, I'm going to talk about as well. It will connect, but from a very different perspective. So my topic is, uh, or my, my presentation will cover three different things. Um, I will talk about relationships between domain ontologies and top-level ontologies and that will provide the motivation for the rest of the talk where we, I talk about the use of first logic reasoning for domain ontologies and then the la last part will be implications for uh, BFO. Now I have no good feeling for the crowd, so I, I, I'm in the impression that a lot of people in here who are domain ontologists or working or domain experts who are interested in domain ontology, uh, domain ontologies, and so I have worked um, for a long time, as I said, in this area, and I think there are two different communities, sub communities in the applied ontology community. Uh, one is are uh, the people who are doing foundational work. Um, you know, who publish their papers at FOIS or at Applied Ontology, and then there are other people who work really at developing on, uh, domain ontologies um, and uh, or help other help domain experts to uh, to develop domain ontologies. And this, there is so there is a split. I don't want to say they don't talk to each other, but there is a clearly distinguishable group of people who do foundational work and other people who do a really applied ontology. And the ideal relationship should be like in this picture. So you, when you do develop your ontology as a domain ontologist, uh, you should be you know, talk to your domain experts who have some theory about the dom and domain and then you talk you have some background in foundational ontology which is crystallized in something like BFO, a top-level ontology and the top-level ontology gives you basically the ontological framework to fill with the content from the domain theories and then you choose a language and voila you get your ontology, yeah? your domain ontology. So this is the idealized picture. So in this picture the foundational ontologists have, uh, you know, are basically doing, doing foundational work which is then applied in, during the ontology development process in domain ontologies. Now, this picture is a lie. There's a, there's a clear break here and that is actually, I'm now saying something very similar as Werner, just from, with different words, there is a disconnect between the foundational work that is done, all the wonderful papers that are published, and the uh, domain ontologies. And the problem is that there is a, just a language disconnect. One group of people uses first order logic or higher order logic or modal logic, something more expressive than first order logic usually. And then the domain ontologists, most of them except for Werner, using OWL. Right? Uh, definitely something less expressive than full first order. Um, and so 
And, the, and there are reasons for that. One of them is that for all there's good tool support, and uh, the but the that means there's a, this pipeline here. The red arrow is broken. You can't just take the results of uh, let's say a paper on dispositions in BFO and apply it in your work. Let me be more concrete and talk about BFO. So in BFO we have three levels, which I BFO informal, which is all the papers that I've written about BFO. Here, this textbook, no, that is that is informal. I call it informal, although, although it's called basic formal ontology. But the papers are don't contain LU's formulas, so it's using formal f formal in a different sense. I'm aware of that, but um, the, so it's not formal. The, the BFO informal is not formal in the sense that there are no mathematical formulas in there. There's no logic. And um, then there is BFO first order logic. There are, I'm simplifying here. There are various variants. The uh, um, last version is from 2020. That's a very nice one. Um, I myself did a version. I think um, Tom Bittner also did a version uh, where there were first order logic axiomatizations. This is basically attempts to axiomatize the results uh, of the BFO informal in first order logic. And this is the first two things, BFO informal and BFO uh, fall, are what foundational ontologists are interested in. But what the domain ontologists use is BFO out, which is basically mostly a taxonomy with some disjoint axioms. To make that a little bit more concrete, BFO OWL 2.0, which is the version of BFO most people use in their domain ontologies, consists of 52 logical axioms, which are 34 of them are subsumption axioms and 18 are disjointness axioms. This is nothing. From a logical point of view, this is completely uninteresting. Nothing happens in this, from a logical point of view, nothing happens in OWL 2.0. The 2020 version is better. I'm here counting here the one with all temporalized relations because I don't like temporalized relations. But uh, it's, it has at least, you know, it has uh, more disjointness axioms and 70, about 70 axioms have, which have some logical content. In comparison, uh, the first order logic version has roughly two, 370 axioms. And, uh, but the number is deceiving. The these onto these uh, axioms are much richer than the, the typically the, the first order logic axioms are much, much richer than the um, OWL axioms. So there are some axioms which, if you would translate them to OWL, would will translate to many axioms. And of course, many of them you couldn't translate to OWL. So there's much, much more content, more than just the, you know, more than twice as much or so as the numbers would suggest. So this is, um, this is why Werner was praising uh, the Cliff version. I'm using Cliff and First Allow Logic uh, interchangeably here. I'm aware of the differences, but you know, for the simplification, I just call it First Allow Logic. Um, so this is why Werner was singing the praises of this version of BFO because you could actually use automatic reasoning to find inconsistencies, which you can't if you all of you have are 52 axioms which don't say anything except here's a taxonomy. Now this is still that's better, but it's you have to realize it's still representing only a small, small fraction of what there is. Barry alone has probably 370 papers on BFO. So if each paper would just contain one axiom, you would, you know. <laughs> so, and that doesn't contain all of the, uh, the other works of people who have done, uh, worked on BFO. So um, that's not this thing. Yeah, and I've, I did my, myself the work, so it's hard to write first order logic axioms. Yeah, that's a lot of a lot of work. It's not that uh, uh, so, but if you would try to capture all the content that is available, you would get to way more axioms. So the BFO axioms are currently under axiomatized. What does it mean? It doesn't mean that almost none of the rich content of BFO is filtering down to the usage of domain experts. 
Yeah, that is the challenge or the problem that I see. And of course, the same I could say about any other top-level ontology. I'm just picking on BFO because Barry is in the room and uh, he likes to be picked on. So, and this is again, so the point that I'm trying to make is the program, progress on ontological foundations is not easily applicable to the development of domain ontologies and um, because of this language disconnect. Now, one reaction you might have is, well, you know, surely we can just use one language. Why, you know, if things are lost in translation, just avoid that by having only one language. But that's not realistic. So first all, logic has a lot of benefits um, for mostly expressivity. You can just say way more than an owl. Um, and if you want to go into nitty gritty details of uh, ontological distinctions, you want to this expressivity or even something more expressive. And um, also, it's a matter of convenience, right? If you study philosophy, you learn first order logic in your first semester, so you're very comfortable with it. And it takes a while to go to a different language, especially if you don't see any benefits. For the, but we can't all of us use first order logic or common logic or, you know, uh, because there are real benefits of uh, the OWL or web ontology, the web ontology language. I'm writing here, it's decidable, that it's a cipher for, it's a computationally much better behaved. The decidability is really not the important thing. It's the much better behaved, uh, and so you, you know, especially if you go to profiles of OWL, which aren't DL, but, you know, less expressive. You have better tool support, uh, which is extremely important, of course, um, for if you want to make an ontology of part of an information system. And arguably, it's easier to learn. Um, I know other people disagree about that, but my observation, it's very easy to teach our Manchester syntax. Um, I teach logic in, for computer scientists, and first order logic is not that easy. Um, I know that because, well, some of the students who, who I teach first order logic in my in second semester in our uh, courses then go to my semantic web course and during the exam they often have to translate stuff both in first order logic and in our Manchester syntax and although they had a whole other semester full of first order logic they make more mistakes translating stuff to first order logic than to our Manchester syntax. Our message, Manchester syntax is really easy to learn comparatively. So we can't, the solution is not stop using OWL. Although I, I heard like Werner was kind of hinting at that, but I don't think that is going to fly. But do we need to make the choice? And my argument is no, we don't need to make that choice. And um, that's the I try to convince you of that in the next part of this presentation. So, the goal is to integrate both OWL and first order logic to what I call FOUL ontologies, because they contain both. And FOUL ontologies have the following goal. So, I want to enable the parallel development of OWL and first order logic ontologies in one place. And the one major constraint is con contain, uh, enable the uses of OWL as it is, because domain ontologists don't want to break their tool chains, so we don't want to put any barriers there, right? So it should, you should keep everything with OWL if you, you know, the way it is. But you also want to use um, be, enable the use of first order logic axioms if you need the additional uh, expressivity. And the solution is to store first order logic axioms and annotations of our entities and then create a tool that enables reasoning over OWL and first order log logic axioms. That way, since it's just annotations, you can, it's basically a normal OWL file, people can keep their OWL tools for the OWL part of the FOWL ontology, but you can use the, the 
the, the whole expressivity of first order logic for the uh, reasoning with the, more, with the annotations. So basically, you have a, our cake and eat it. And with respect to BFO, the goal is to integrate uh, BFO first order logic, so the version that uh, the axioms, which are so much more richer, with the OWL domain ontologies. ontologies. And the, uh, the way of doing that is basically using the BFO OWL version that people already import and then put annotations with cliff axioms. And some of you will say, well, we already have that because BFO 2.0 had these cliff axioms as annotations. The only problem was so far they were there just for you to look at them and admire the beauty. You couldn't do anything with them. All right? So what was missing was, the, uh, was this tool which allows you to do the integration and then have a first order logic translation of your domain ontology with the first order logic uh, version of BFO. So what do I mean with using annotations to, um, to um, improve what you can do in OWL? Here's a very simple example. All of you know probably that parthood is a very important relationship in almost every ontology. And, um, but you probably never have, or some of you might have not thought about the fact that we don't use proper parthood. We use parthood in domain ontologies. Parthood, you know, uh, proper parthood is uh, defined as a part which is not its itself. So in that sense, I'm a part of myself, but I'm not a proper part of myself. And when domain ontologists talk about parts, they always mean proper parts. Nobody in his right mind means part, parthood in the gen more general sense. Only logicians and mathematicians do that kind of stuff. Right? So and domain experts will always use proper part, even if they just part, say part. But we don't use that relationship in OWL ontologies for a very simple reason. OWL doesn't let us. If you try to put in proper part in, uh, in your... In, in your OWL ontology and you say, okay, part, proper part is irreflexive, asymmetric, and transitive, and you click the buttons here in Protege, then your reasoner will yell at you and say, no, you can't do that because it violates the OWL constraints. So how do we, and so this is a constraint of OWL we have to live with, but if we want for some reason to really have proper part, we can use annotations and then you Here's the example, so we, let me use the mouse. So here this is proper parthood, and here it says, as you, most of you probably know, okay, it's transitive, and you can do that just in Protege, and then you add two additional clef annotations to say, oh, it's irreflexive and, uh, and asymmetric. And that way, you have all of the information there in the for what it means to be a proper part. And um, if you, uh, with the tool, um, the Gavel tool that, I'm, that we implemented, you can also translate this all to one first order logic theory. And then you do, if you do reasoning, you're using the proper axioms for proper parthood. And not just, you know, the, the transitivity. So the general approach is of this form. You, we have an annotation subject, which is in this particular case proper part of, but it could be a class or any other OWL entity. We have the annotation property, which is as any other annotation property in, in OWL, you know, like RDFS label or something. No, it's uh, only it's called cliff annotation to make clear it's a cliff. Uh, formula and then what you get is the formula you want to put there. And uh, of, we also support uh, TPTP which is another syntax uh, which is uh, very well used, uh, much used in the automatic reasoning community. And the advantage here is that you have one tool, Protege, which allows you to edit both first order logic and OWL 
um, and you have things in close proximity, it, you don't have two different files which you need to maintain independently. And as I said, since there are annotations, all tools will just ignore them, as they do with most annotations, and you, nothing will break. It's just from, their, from the perspective of your old, old chain, uh, owl tool chain is just another comment. From the perspective of Gavel Owl, which is the name of the tool which we implemented, um, you, it's basically meaningful and it translates it into first order logic. So the rule, tool of the, so what the tool does more specifically is it um, translates Owl to first order logic. It passes the cliff and the um, TPTP annotations, harmonizes the signatures, and produce an integrated OWL theory, uh, first order logic theory, in TPTP format. And then it allows you, the tool allows you to interact with the first order logic reasoner, in particular, Vampire. So, in short, um, what we have is a tool for integrating or well, translating foul ontologies into TPTP ontologies. The, this is the architecture. I actually will skip that slide for time reasons and talk a little bit about the evaluation of this idea. Now, so the first question you might raise, okay, can you do something interesting with it? Can you do, I mean, you can do additional inferences, but are they meaningful? And um, one way we early evaluated that was to look at uh, papers where people were talking about, you know, here are the constraints of OWL and we don't get further. And uh, this is part, this, what I'm talking about now comes from a paper from Maria Kate in 2012, where she looked at marrow topology and the result was that only six of the 25 axioms uh, that she had for marrow topology were expressible in OWL. If you use FOWL, so the OWL with first logic annotations, you can express 22 of them. The last three we couldn't get uh, because you would need higher order logic, which is, uh, would be a generalization of our approach, but uh, then you have to deal with even slower reasoner, so that's a drawback. And um, and with the result of that, we could we we explored the kind of inferences that uh, that was you know intended with this kind of marrow topology, and we could just show that some of the infer new inferences are, are possible, which are ontologically meaningful and couldn't be done in our on their own, on its own. So it's a very very silly example, but let's say we have a class which is o OVGU part, which is OVGU is the my university, so my the part of the university, and it's said it's defined to its part of of the of the university, and it overlaps with Magdeburg, which is the city where it's located in. And Without that annotation, nothing follows. Interesting follows. If you have that annotation, which basically says if something isn't a part of something else, then there exists something which is a part of the, uh, of the first thing and doesn't overlap with the second thing. And if you add that, that's, so that's a meritopological axiom from that paper, then you can, for example, infer that the University of Magdeburg is part of Magdeburg. Sorry, the yeah, the university is part of the city. That's an example for something which is uh, you couldn't infer without the additional expressivity of the first law logic. The second question you might think: Okay, this is neat for a toy example, uh, but I build a large ontology, and I don't want something that only works on small, small, nice toy examples. We need to. Does it work for large examples? Does it work for real ontologies? And uh, when we tried to evaluate that, we had a problem. There are no big ontologies with a lot of first order logic annotations. So we needed to create one. And um, we, the, so we created a foul version of Cabby. I don't know whether you are, know Cabby. 
uh, if you're working in biology and life sciences, you, you probably know it. It's a chemical entities of biological interests. It's an owl ontology and it's part of the OVO foundry and it has roughly 160,000 classes. So substantially sized ontology. And um, what our task was now to validate the OWL classification with, um, um, of CABI with first logic reasoning. That was the idea. And for that purpose, we created, um, as I said, first logic annotations. And in order to, for you to understand what we did, I need to talk a little bit about how that worked. So here's an example for a typical chemical class in CABI. And the interesting bit is this chemical, it's defined by its chemical structure. And this chemical structure is codified in these smile strings. How they work doesn't really matter for your you know, in detail. The point is this encodes the structure, which is visually represented there. And we you can translate these in first order logic. So here's a first order logic representation of smiles, of that smiles. So this is a, the definition of nitrile in first uh, in, in TP, this is TPTP -TP syntax. And um, well, as you see, it's very much more complicated. So I'm, you know, nobody, no chemist will ever want to look at that. Uh, this is much, well, that's a, more complicated than most people would write, uh, ex, well, most people would be able to write uh, axioms. But so we wanted to have a challenge. So we got one, right? And this is actually easy. Here is here's a test for the audience, for your chemical. <laughs> Try to guess what this, chemi this, this chemical structure defines. And the, the one difference is that the one, the net nitrile is an open formula. Uh, this one is closed, so it's a fully defined what the, uh, what the molecule is. Do you have a guess? Water. Very good. It's indeed water. <laughs> so this is, you can imagine, the, it's really, really large axioms if you get to larger chemicals, right? So. Now the task was then we picked 80 of the non, non uh, these more generic classes, the mid-level like nitrile, and then 6,569 uh, fully specified classes, so the leaf nodes in CABI, like water, and then we validate, uh, validated with the f the using first order logic reasoning whether the axiom in uh, whether the subsumption holds, right? So in, for example, is water a subclass of nitrile? And so 80 times 6,469, it's about 500,000 subsumptions that were tested. And uh, so we used Gavel, our, our tool, and Vampire as a reasoner had a timeout of 30 seconds. So each proof attempt for such a uh, subsumption hypothesis timed out after 30 seconds. And we had a CPU cluster with 80 jobs and four CPUs each. And after 24 hours, uh, all jobs were done. And in 30%, we had a timeout. So that timeout just means this, the reasoner was not able to come to a conclusive result in this particular case. So in 70% of the cases, we had an answer. And mostly, CABI is correct. It's a very good ontology, after all. But we found some uh, things where we came to, with first order logic reasoning, to, um, well, conflicting results. In 10,000 10, cases, we had a subclass B is proven by vampire, but it's not in CABI. So CABI doesn't know about it, either because there's a mission or because the smile string is, uh, is wonky. So potential bugs. And we had 256 times where A is the subclass of B in CABI, but Vampire said, no, that's not the case because I can find a counterexample. Um, that should really, we were very surprised that the latter happened. Um, and one of them was here that, um, that uh, particular example, I'm not trying to uh, 
pronounce it. Uh, I couldn't even do that in German. But uh, so this thing was classified as nitrile, and then, uh, but our vampire said no. And um, we, it was actually, we reported it as bug, and it was fixed, so it was indeed an error, error in cabbie. So what does that mean? Well, it means the following. First of all, it is true that OWL is much more computationally much better behaved than first order logic and you can do things with um, you you are certain because it's decidable that you will get an answer in finite amount of time that is not the case in first order logic we always have timeouts but it is not the case that first order logic reasoning is useless for that reason this example shows that you can use rather complex axioms and still use the first order lo logic axioms as annotations here of the OWL ontology and then use these axioms to validate the content of the um, of your domain ontology. And this leads me to the application to BFO. So, when I um, originally, uh, much of this work is done, was done by Simon Flügel, who wrote his bachelor thesis with us, and I, he implemented uh, Gavel Owl, and uh, so did all this mapping and the joining, and uh, I told him, well, if you want to have write a thesis, it needs to have an evaluation, your job is to evaluate whether the open en energy ontology is consistent with uh, the BFO first order logic axioms that you know were written by Allen in 2020. So thought brilliant would be you know, easy easy ask for Simon. And I just to mention what is the open energy ontology? It doesn't really matter. It's an ontology we are building, and Simon has worked on it, so he was familiar with it. Uh, it's for the energy domain. The only important thing for this talk is it's based on BFO OWL 2.0. So that version of BFO which does not have any semantic content except for taxonomy with a few disjointness axioms. And um, so the idea was just use that and reuse the first logic annotations that were available and uh, use Gavel OWL to translate the open energy ontology including the basic uh, BFO 2.0 to first order logic, integrate the, first, the theory with, with the BFO first order logic annotations, and check the results for uh, resulting theory for consistency. Should be straightforward. So I thought otherwise I wouldn't have given the job to a bachelor student. Um, but it isn't. Because if you so what's the relationship between BFO OWL and BFO first order logic? Well, what I expected is that if we translate BFO OWL to BFO and first order logic, then this should, the resulting theory should obviously be weaker than, it's also in first order logic, but it should be weaker because you start out with something which is very weak. So this should be entailed by BFO first order logic. But that's not the case. Um, it's not the case for various reasons. Um, one issue is time, the other has to do with instantiations, and the third one is our tool is based on the official OWL uh, semantics. They're all, you know, as specified of, as by W3C. Uh, so um, there are some wonkiness which has to do with that. I won't go into that. Detail, but the problem is because this doesn't entail this whole idea of of just you know use plug in the the BFO foul uh, version and you know run run the reasoner and check whether the domain ontology is consistent with the first order logic axioms doesn't work very well. And let me show a little bit more details uh, of why. Where, where, the, where it breaks down. So one axiom which is in this ontology says aircraft subclass of vehicle. Yeah? So if you follow the book, the translation is for everything. 
holds, if it's an aircraft, then it's a vehicle. What BFO expects, BFO Foul expects, and uh, Werner will be happy that I recognize the fact is, well, no, this is an instantiation relationship here, and we have, you say basically for everything and every time, if X is an instance of the universal aircraft at time t, then is an instance of the universal vehicle at time t. Right? So, for, there are various differences. One difference is aircraft here is a unary predicate, here it's a constant. It's why, uh, a secondary difference is this is a, here you have a ternary relation instantiation which doesn't even show up up here. And you have this time index. Other example. Biogas subclass of has part some methane. It's translated if if it's a, if something is biogas, then there is something which it has its part, and that's methane. That's the that's the textbook translation. The, what BFO wants to have is if something an instant is an instance of the universal biogas at time t, then there is something which has as a part. Um, uh, there is some, then there is some y which x has as a part at t and y is methane, instantiates methane and t. Again, the tricky part here is particular the has part relationship which is ternary which OWL doesn't do very well, doesn't have ternary relations. And for people who have been around here for a longer period, they will recognize, oh, that's a discussion we have had for at least 10 years. And this is how to ch represent change over time in BFO, right? Because here you have this time indexed uh, relationship. And this gets more, even more tricky if you have something like every leaf is at some time part of a tree. Here you suddenly have two time indexes. You have again the time index part of the relation, but you have here the instantiation of something as a leaf at some time t, and then there's another t prime, where which at that t prime x is uh, the, the leaf needs to be part of the tree. Right? So you even have different times. And that's one of the questions of how to, you know, how to do with that, do that. I mean, this is, leads us to the whole question of how do we represent ch change over time in OWL, uh, in BFO OWL. And Alan will talk about that, so I won't steal his thunder. And um, Ludger will also talk about it. And, uh, I, but I, I should at least give you a hint of, you know, how, uh, what the options are. So the both of them will talk in detail about this. But here is, um, here is um, one suggestion. It's basically leaf is a subclass of part of it sometime on, uh, part of it sometime, some tree. So this is part of, a, part of it sometime is uh, one blob. Yeah? The, so this is one solution. Uh, how to fix this. When I say fix it, it's, it's not really fixing it in my opinion because if you then run this through the translation, you still see differences here, right? So you don't have the instantiation uh, of leaf at a time, so that part you don't get. And of course, you, this blob really hides the existential quantifier. Ludger is pre going to present an alternative approach, which is more complicated. Um, it's Ludger uh, um, and Niels have been working on this for the last years more intensively. And originally, the idea came from Stefan, I think, Stefan Schulz. Jana and I were also involved. So the idea is here that you to treat the, the, you don't you don't move the time to the relationships, but you move the time to the conti continuance. So, in addition to the leaf, we have also the leaf today and the leaf yesterday. These are additional entities. And while the leaf today may not be part of some tree, the leaf yesterday was part of the tree yesterday. And that way you represent this picture that a leaf could be part, was at some point part of a tree. The advantage of this is you only have binary relations in this picture. So, the idea is 
since you only need binary relations, you can do that in R. Ludger is going to say probably way more than about, about that, so I'm not going to talk about it in details. I just use that in order to show the kind of hurdles we uh, show that this is a problem that has been around and it's complicated to solve. I am, um, although I used to be involved in that approach, have now a third approach, which is don't move the index, the temporal index, to the relations or the continuance, move it to the ontology. And the idea is, ontolo all ontologies provide a static view of the world, and so they are temporalized ontologies, right? And um, part of x part of y means x is part of y at some time t, which is fixed by the ontology. And since it's fixed by the ontology, you don't need to talk about it anymore. This is basically a variant of the perspectivalism. We don't say, we say an ontology is, is not just, you know, on a specific level of granularity and looking at it from a, perspective, a particular perspective, but also at its, uh, at its certain time. And this works perfectly when representation of time doesn't matter. And the title of this talk is Time Matters. I agree with them, but not always. Sometimes it doesn't matter very much, and then you can go away with that. So the simple solution, and that was the solution my poor student took when I gave him an impossible task, um, was to say, okay, we, he created what he called B for now, and by now he meant, you know, we don't care about the future, we don't care about the past, we just do uh, it now, and we use BFO owl, and we use a static version of BFO fall, and harmonize the signature, and use that in order to validate domain ontologies. And here is a version uh, of what I mean by simplifying, Above you have the an axiom from uh, which says an independent continuum at some uh, at some time. Um, well, if X is an independent, independent continuum at some time, then there exists a spatial region uh, at that time, which uh, and so that X is located at that spatial region. So a lot of X's uh, in addition to the X's, some T's and the instantiation, and he just did that version out of it. So no T allowed, right? The T is basically relative to the ontology. So you say in, uh, you have an independent continuum, then there must be a region which, so that X is located there. This is equivalent to basically fixing everything to a time point. You, you just replace all the universal quantifiers, uh, which are quantifying over time and replacing them with one constant and then you say okay we just ignore that constant because it's given by its parameter by the ontology so and uh, so and that was um, so he used that in order to uh, to validate the open energy ontology and it's not that the open energy energy ontology doesn't have a notion of time involved in some aspects. So the distinction between, for example, a fossil fuel and a renew renewable fuel has to do with its origin. And origin inherently has to do something with time related. But we just modeled it in the ontology as with a has or origin relationship. So you don't need to do the temporal quantification. Now, so this, is, this was basically the version that works with the tools that we had at the time, and uh, Simon could get his thesis done. But you may ask, what happens if I need to talk about temporal change? Is there other way of doing it? Well, for example, if you're interested in ontogenesis, I mean, you can't talk about the chain, you know, development of, let's say, a mouse embryo without talking about time. Um, one way of sim still being you know, simple and not having to, to work with the complicated matter of you know, the complicated solutions that my colleagues will present is just to say, well, let's just use one ontology which talks about the stuff which are always the case for mice anatomy. And then if you have 23 stages of mice development, do for each stage uh, develop a, a version of the ontology 
uh, you know, of the anatomy, which contains the axioms which are true at that time. Right? So again, the idea is the time index is, not, is moved to the ontology. The ontology provides you a static view of what is true at a g given stage. So that way, you don't need to worry about, you say, I still have timeless axioms which are relative to a particular stage. So that's again a solution which I like because it's very simple and you don't need to worry about basically pr going beyond the boundaries of OWL, which is why the other solutions are so hard. Now, what, what if that isn't sufficient? So let's say we want to say, um, and we want to go and represent the example with the leaf. So one other way is, of course, to use uh, the cliff annotation. So you just say the, 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 owl, on, the owl part of my, my foul ontology is static. But that doesn't mean that my first logic annotations can be dynamic. So in this particular case, we say, OK, we have a leaf. And we have a tree, uh, or we have leaf and tree in our ontology as, as disjoint classes. And then the, for uh, the uh, leaf, you say, OK, if something is a leaf, then it exists a time when, um, when um, the leaf is pro a proper part of some tree. And then you can use that and maybe introduce also fallen leaf, so the leaf that is of, on, the, on the ground that would be leaf with, which is not proper part of some tree. So you, what you can do in, in owl, you do in owl, and what you can't do, you just do in cliff. That would be the, the idea of using, again, first order logic annotations. <laughs> now, notice that, I, that we have now two different proper parts here. We have your proper part, which is a binary relationship, and the proper part of that relationship, uh, of, uh, which is a Turner relationship, um, which has a time index. And in order to bridge both, you need then to add axioms, which, for example, like proper part of xy is true if and only if pro proper part of xy and t0, where t0 is the time index which is provided by the ontology. So this could be you know, stage 22, for example. Now, is that solving all problems? Well, it's not solving all problems. It, depend, and, you know, it depends on how much time represented, explicit representation of time you need. So here is, let's assume you go with the, exa the example I said before. We, we have a stage one ontology and stage 23 ontology about the human, or well, the development of an embryo. And in the first, let's say some tissue is part of some organ in stage one, and in stage 23, the tissue is part of some other organ, C, right? And let's assume nothing can be part of both organs because you know one is the liver, the other is the heart or something, right? So if you now individually, they are fine, but since we had the time index the ontology, if you now import both in the same ontology, so if you create the soup, you know, the joint ontology, that would be inconsistent because suddenly you would have something which uh, you would have things, the instances of things would be part of both of B and C. So we can't have that, right? So that would be a problem. Now, uh, one way of avoiding that, and that is would be to then do the first order, instead of trying to join the owl, join the first order logic translations. But now we need a, we need a BFO specific first order logic translation, which is not the one which follows the uh, owl standard. Because now you would have basically to say, OK, uh, our instantiation relation is time indexed, right? So this is uh, the. Um, and so we would here say, for example, for all, for all x is true if x instantiates a at stage one, then there is something which um, x, is part, uh, x has as part at stage one 
and uh, that thing is of type B and the same thing you do analog uh, here in the same way for, for stage 20, 23 and if you combine these axioms they are of course not violating any problems right because you have the time index explicitly here so the fact that tissue the some tissue of type A is part of an organ B at stage 1 is, doesn't contradict the fact that it can be later at stage three, 23 be part of uh, organ C. So this is the integration of this first logic representation is consistent however this doesn't work with our version of Gavel yet because we're following the standard translation and this would be basically not following the tra standard translation because you basically need to you know you do a BFO version where, where you smuggle in time indexed instantiation relationships. So let me um, come to the end. Where do I see, what do I see as uh, for the future of BFO? I believe that in order to, need to use the benefits of the content of all the good work that our foundational community does and uh, you know all the um, insights that are in these in these papers, uh, hidden in these papers, and maybe formalized in first order logic, but not in OWL, um, we should uh, create um, tightly integrated version of BFO, which contain both the OWL axioms and the BFO axioms, so that we then can use the com the existing tools for uh, for the OWL tool chains. Or for, for the OWL uh, world and the semantic web world with, uh, with the OWL part of our domain ontologies but then use the first logic content in order to validate the um, domain ontologies with the first logic axiomatization of BFO and the problem is to make that really or a challenge is in, in order to make that really viable for for in a way th that is BFO compatible, we need to have something which doesn't use the standard translation from OWL to first order logic, but have this BFO iced version of it, where you, ha you have the instantiation relationship and time index. So, in summary, both OWL and first order logic have desirable features. The idea that we can give up one one and just use the other is, I don't think, that works. Uh, people will use, continue to use both for good reasons. And my proposal is to embrace that and just instead of, uh, but in contrast to previous years, have them integrated in, uh, and not have development of, of the OWL version of BFO kind of almost independent of the first logic version. And that way we, we don't have uh, this loss of information that we currently have from the first solar logic version to the OWL version. And the advantage of that will be better, higher quality of uh, our domain ontologies where we find problems automatically and don't just need to you know, manually look for errors. Thank you.